Excellent. And I thank uh, Diana Hurst, uh, who suggested this presentation. And uh, thank you for displaying it. Excellent. Now, organic agriculture invented in Kent, is it true? If you're in Kent, you may recognise this sign just down the road from the university. We will get to Lord Northbourne and how, when and why he came to coin the term organic farming and how he came to write a manifesto of organic agriculture. But first, let's consider some context, which is a little bit more grim because he takes us back, the roots of organic agriculture go back to World War I and it's had before that. The war, as you remember, brought chemical warfare on an industrial scale. And it laid the foundation for chemical agriculture on an industrial scale. And let's see why that is the case. Fritz Heber played a key role in laying those foundations for chemical warfare and then flipping it to chemical farming on an industrial scale. He was a brilliant chemist. He won the Nobel Prize. And in 1913, he, he was responsible for the Hayden Bosch process, which you might remember from school was about fixing nitrogen. And at school, you might have wondered, I didn't know nitrogen needed fixing. Well, uh, your teacher meant that he had a process, Haber had a process for capturing nitrogen out of the air. And that enabled cheap and abundant explosives. And then cheap and abundant fertilizer. He was a German Jew. So later that um, he, uh, he, uh, he came to, uh, to the end, let's say. Uh, he was also responsible for uh, poison gas during World War One. So his Nobel Prize was, uh, was rather unpopular in some quarters. Now, Australia had a spy in Germany during the war. Maybe many, but anyway. Uh, this woman, Ethel Cooper, she was a civilian witness to the living conditions, what was happening, because Britain was blockading Germany, and that was very successful. It made civilian life very challenging. Ethel wrote, living was more and more complicated every week. One has to manage somehow there are substitutes for everything artificial honey artificial jam artificial meat everything you can think of so civilians struggled on and sometimes they didn't struggle on they um, they died uh, where they could they made do with ersatz food and fake food let's look at another australian who was who was also involved in the war. He described Ernesto Junone. He was an Australian stretcher bearer from the AIF on the song. He, he was an artist. He described the situation that he was seeing on the song as hell. But he painted this picture. He was an artist. And he painted this picture as a fundraising postcard to raise funds for people displaced by the war. But Look at what he's got. He has the howl in the lower part of the picture, and then rising out of that howl, maybe something good can come of this. Maybe something beautiful can come of it. His question was, like in any crisis, can we build back better? Apart from surviving, can we build back better? And another person who had this kind of idea and explored it is Rudolf Steiner. New Age philosopher, the founder of anthroposophy. Now he had a more lucky experience, if you could say that, of World War One, because he was living in Switzerland. He had an Austrian passport. He decided to live in Berlin half of the time. He had an apartment there, and he spent half of the time in Switzerland, in Donau, and looking between the two. And as with Ernesto, can we build back better? Steiner, Royal Steiner, had many irons in that particular fire. And agriculture was the final of his irons that he put in the fire after the war. He went to Kobovitz, Kobovitz, 
in Poland, the Sioux Poland, and he ran the agricultural course in the, the summer of 1924. He delivered eight lectures on agriculture, and he said that was about what anthroposophy, his spiritualism, has to say about agriculture. Sabovitz, by the way, was in German at that time. Now, the three key ideas that Rolf Steiner presented in 1920 to his audience were that the farm is an organism. And this is going to give you a clue about where this is going, because eventually we end up with Kent, in Kent and Lord Northland. So his message was the farm is an organism that natural, not synthetic, is the way to go with farming and other things, of course. And he called for a differentiated agriculture, differentiated from the chemical agriculture that was then engulfing the world because of this flood of synthetic fertilizer, which was repurposed from, from the war, as far as it. Now, Rudolf Steiner returned out to his sick bed three months after this war. He died six months after that. And so this was the only time he spoke about agriculture, the only course that he ran. However, the course was published in German and English, promptly, promptly published in German and English. This is a German copy. This particular copy is the first copy that's made its way to Australia. You see that the copies are numbered. This one is 165, it's the German copy. It has the name of the recipient and it's the Giannone, the that uh, guy who painted that uh, picture. And it's a very well-worn and repaired copy. The interesting thing that Rudolf Steiner did at Kovovitz was to establish an experimental circle, what he called the experimental circle. And that was, an, that was a group to test the ideas that he presented at Kovovitz. And they grew because the, the course was published, then the experimental circle grew to encompass people all over the world, including including Britain, including Australia, USA, etc. The task of progressing little science agricultural ideas fell to this experimental circle. There were farmers and gardeners around the world. The task was to test Rudolf Steiner's hints. He called them hints. Oh, have we lost the slides or not? Mm -hmm. Or is it just me? We'll probably get that back for you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the answer. So this is where ideas fed back to. This is uh, Anthroposophy Headquarters, it's at Donat, Switzerland, the building is still there, it still looks like that, and as you can see, it's a rather spectacular building near Basel. And this is a small building behind the main building, where the mission of the experimental circle was coordinate, coordinated by a young chemist named Ernst Pfeiffer. His lab was in this building, it's called the Glass House. You sit behind the Gertiana when you visit there. Go check it out. Now, so we see this sequence. From the Kovovitz course, the experimental circle grew. And then from the experimental circle, those farmers who were testing these ideas were anthroposophists. So they thought what they were testing was anthroposophic farming. But in the course of the next decade and a half, this evolved under the tutelage of Aaron Pompey, to be called biodynamic farming. In the meantime, well, the Nazis uh, tend to rise in Germany. All books by Royal Steiner were banned, including the agriculture course. Remember, however, that the anthropological headquarters were in Switzerland, so the work continued. Rudolf Steiner at that point was dead and banned. Now this is the book that Ernst Pfeiffer produced. 
in the course of 1924 to 1938, he produced this book. It was pub he wrote it in German, it was published simultaneously in English, Dutch, French, and Italian. And the reason why was that Rora Steiner had said, test my ideas and publish them. Now I'm going to leave us in uh, in Switzerland for a moment, leave Switzerland in 1938, remember, and we're going to get North, Northbourne and Kent into the picture. Let's step him back a little in time. He was a student at Oxford University. He studied a Bachelor of, Art, Agriculture, Bachelor of Arts in Agriculture at his College, Northern College. You may, some of you will recognise that. He's hung away from home in Kent. Uh, he was a lecturer in agriculture at Oxford University. He was a governor at the Y College Kent, and he was a governor also um, at uh, Swan Swanley Horticultural College in Kent. So he was a well credentialed. Ultimately, he was very well credentialed comment about agriculture. This is uh, Lord Northbourne, uh, the tall person in uh, uh, the, this is the Queen Mother, and the tall person uh, without any headgear is Lord Northbourne. Thank you for He described himself as a farmer and a landowner. So with a degree in agriculture, teaching experience at Oxford, the governor of two agricultural college and practical farming experience, he was in a good position to consider ideas of agriculture. And now we're going to get to Beth Sanger. What was the significance of this? Um, North Thorn visited Erin Pride Pfeiffer in Switzerland and the, the task was to convince Pfeiffer to come to his farm, to North Thorn's farm, and present a conference, which was a successful challenge. And uh, in, six months later, in July, nine days in July, was the summer school and conference on biodynamic farming and the Beth Sanger conference for short because it was at the Beth Sanger North Thorn's North estate. And thank you to uh, Mark uh, Moody for um, finding this uh, document, which has been out of circulation for more than 80 years. Thank you, Mark. Pfeiffer was the key, the star of North Thorn's conference. With that conference, he said, he wrote later, the spirit of friendliness, happiness, and unity which prevailed, he wrote, for nine days, the possibility of war was scarcely alluded to. So it wasn't a secret that war was perhaps coming. And then it came, just three months later. Less than three months later, Germany invaded Poland. So Poland, again, comes into our story of the history of organic agriculture. Two days later, Britain was at war. Now, Northbourne was in a quandary. He had met this great German bloke with great agricultural ideas, but the market has just evaporated for telling stories about great German blokes. So, how to solve this quandary? He wrote a book. Oh, yes, and before he wrote the book, yes. So, this is the trend. This is the 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 uh, these ideas move from Kovovitz to Kent. 1924 it took to 1939 to get them. Pfeiffer was the vector, and Pfeiffer posted these ideas in Donark for 14 or 15 years before taking them to Kent. The book that Northbourne wrote was Look to the Land. It was just came out just 10 months after the conference. It's uh, well worth a read, it's an easy read. Uh, he, uh, he's a good writer, much better than Fiverr. Uh, he introduced this new terminology, organic farming, and this is an, a manifesto of organic farming. So this is the first appearance in, in, uh, in print of the term organic farming. He wrote of the contest between organic farming and chemical farming. He alerted people that this was a fight. He acknowledged that biodynamics 
evolved in accordance with the recommendations of the late Dr. Rudolf Steiner. He acknowledged that. The method has been highly developed in the course of some 15 years' work on the continent, and its effectiveness can be said to be proved. He commented on lots of things. On junk food, he said, the delusion is that cheapness leads to plenty, but what used is junk food. He wrote on oneness, the independence of living creatures, interdependence of living creatures. There is a very real economic and biological linkage, comprehensive and of infinite complexity between all living creatures in the world. Very clear, coherent writer. On reductionism, he said, no chemist has ever analysed or described in chemical terms a living creature, however humble, and there is not the slightest chance that he ever will. On chemistry, he wrote, Tommy cannot be treated as a mixture of chemistry and cost accounting for Nature will not be driven, the try, she will hit back spoiling and very hard. On a precautionary principle, I'm going to uh, skip a bit of this, so I'm going to say, if we wait, no, if, uh, yeah, let's look at the last part of this. It is a regrettable fact that the demand for scientific proof is a weapon often used to delay the development of an idea. If you've been involved in adequacy, you might recognize that. He wrote, remembering, this is this is during World War II. He says, we have tried to conquer nature by force and by intellect. It now remains for us to try the way of love. Interesting sentiment, don't they? And uh, how long is this going to take? Well, it's a task for generations. And those engaged will be fighting a rear guard action for many decades, perhaps for centuries. So, if you're pushing for organic agriculture, you might be fighting for and you And you remember that maxim of Jesus Christ, which states, a prophet is without honour in his own country. Well, North Point ideas were adopted. They were adopted very quickly. But firstly, they were adopted in the USA in 1942. And secondly, they were adopted in Australia. And only later were they adopted in Okay. In the USA, 1942, Jerome Rodale published the world's first organic periodical. This is 1942, two years after his idea. And in Australia, we have the Australian Organic Farming and Gardening Association, founded in 1944, so during the war. So it's picking up on North Point's language. It's the world's first Organics Association, an association dedicated to organic agriculture. What about Britain? Well, if Balfour, some of you will be familiar with, <clears throat> he wrote a book, The Living Soil. Two things to note about this. Eight pages of the first chapter are just one long quote from North Wind's book. And the second thing I want to say about it is she missed the point, the key point that Steiner Fife from North Wind talked about, and that is we want a differentiated agriculture that's different markedly different from chemical agriculture and and that organic agriculture with the framing and the naming of that idea she missed that sadly and she went on to be a founder of the soil association but again you see the soil association is not the organic association so you see the point there a little bit organic has now gone global this is a supermarket in china and he was trying to send to the supermarket, something similar in every supermarket in China, and organics is now around the world an international phenomenon. The key exclusions, just to remind you, are synthetic fertilizers, synthetic pesticides, GMOs, engineered nanoparticles, and irradiation. And this is a map of where we're at. 187 countries report organic agriculture. And this is a this is a density equalizing map. What it means is we have resized countries according to how many certified organic hectares that they report. report. Where a country is bigger than you might expect, it means better than average. And where it's smaller, it means there are less than average. So you see Australia doing 
very strongly. It's in a dominant position. And you, you see that UK is, is bigger than you might expect. And so it's above average. This is the companion map for biodynamics. And you see that it's a lesser proliferation. It's to 55 countries, much lower number of bears. You see the concentration is uh, much more so concentrated on in Europe and particularly in Germany. Uh, but here, yeah, Britain is doing now uh, okay, which is what you would expect. And what about the nemesis of, uh, of organic agriculture, GM farming? Here's the comparable map. And you see North America, South America dominate that map, and Europe just about disappears. Australia just about disappears, uh, and uh, many other countries do. While this is uh, concentrated, very strongly concentrated in, in those two continents. North Vaughan stood on the shoulders of giants. And like Isaac Newton said, if I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And I'm going to skip this. The two giants that he stood on the shoulders of were Rolf Steiner and Aaron Fleischmann. And from, he took the idea of the farm as an organism from Steiner and he took the work and the enthusiasm of Python, and which was published in 1938. And in 1940, he came up with this term, organic farming. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, seriously on the rise. This is a uh, zero, uh, starting from zero here, uh, the scale. And this is the rise from the last 20 years. And uh, congratulations to the Lord Northbourne for introducing us to us the term organic farming and uh, congratulations to Kent for uh, hosting this crucial conference of 1939, which, uh, which, which led the way for organic agriculture to be an international phenomenon. And uh, thank you. And uh, I'm going to invite questions. Thank you very, very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Now, I'm going to produce something really extraordinary here, an actual person who is with me in the room I'm going to present. So we've got another real treat coming up. And cunningly, I'm going to introduce him as how it takes him to walk up. Our next speaker is Dr. Simon.